Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopez, and today I'm, I'm here with Dr. Patrick Tom Hogan. He is Distinguished Professor of the Department of English and the Institute for Brain and Cognitive Sciences at the University of Connecticut in the U.S. His specialties are literary theory, cognitive and effective science of literature, and world literature. He is the author of several books, including The Mind and Its Stories, What Literature Teaches Us About Emotion, and Beauty and Sublimity. So, Dr. Colm Hogan, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay, so the first thing I would like to ask you, and I think that it is a very, it is very important for people to get a good grasp of this concept because it is very central for today's discussion, uh, uh, and uh, because we're talking about uh, literary universals and aesthetic universals, uh, and uh, to talk about these, I mean, we include uh, knowledge from several areas, including psychology, anthropology, and also, of course, the humanities. So, what are basically human universals? There are different phrases used for this general area of study. Human universals is one, cultural universals, uh, more specific terms such as linguistic or literary universals, uh, and they have slightly different usages. Uh, human universals and cultural universals are generally used, not uniformly, but generally used to refer to patterns that recur across all uh, cultures and traditions. Um, linguistic universals and literary universals those phrases are used more broadly uh, to cover patterns that recur across what are called genetically and aerially distinct traditions or cultures with a greater frequency than would be expected by chance. So um, uh, in the terminology of linguistics, uh, human or cultural universals, that those phrases are usually used to refer to what linguists or what I am discussing uh, literary universals would refer to as absolute universals or sometimes near absolute universals, patterns that recur across almost all uh, cultures or traditions. Uh, whereas a literary and linguistic uh, study of universals would include what are called statistical and implicational universals. Statistical universals are, as I say, those that they may uh, recur uh, suppose by chance you would expect, uh, uh, take a linguistic example, uh, uh, head complement relations in a phrase. Uh, you would, since they can go either head first or head last, you would or take the specific example of subjects and objects. Since they can go either subject object or object subject, they can go in those two, two orders. By chance, you would expect them to recur 50, roughly 50% subject-object and 50% object-subject. Well, in fact, across languages, it does sometimes happen that you get object-subject as normal word order, but it's extremely rare. So it's, it, it's considered a statistical universal with a high degree of probability that you'll get subject-object order. Um, the basic difference for those uh, distinctions in uh, uh, terminology uh, would be that uh, there'd be basically two. First of all, if you're interested only in absolute universals, you're probably going to look almost entirely to evolutionary explanations. Now, in fact, you can get an absolute universal without it being fully determined by evolutionary precedents. Uh, because there are many other things that recur across cultures, and we'll probably get to some of those in the course of the conversation. But uh, it tends to be the case that people look to evolution. Uh, now, evolution is certainly important in looking at statistical universals, um, but you're also more likely to look at other factors, sometimes factors about the physical universe, the things that we encounter in the world, uh, sometimes uh, factors having to do with group dynamics, the way that groups tend to interact, sometimes complex systems analyses, just the way that complex systems tend to work, and so on. So uh, those that would be the basic uh, 
uh, and so uh, to give a very brief example, uh, and when I discuss narrative universals, patterns and narrative that recur cross culturally, whether they recur in all traditions or only in a surprisingly large number of them, a statistically significantly larger number than would be expected. Uh, either way, I have a whole a range a whole range of things that go into explaining them. They are they aren't determined. Uh, they aren't simply adaptive. They aren't simply the uh, product of uh, genetic evolution. Mm-hmm. Okay. And we'll get into some of those later. Mm-hmm. Yes, sure. Uh, and it's very interesting that you distinguish between absolute and statistical universals, because that means that for us to consider something as a human universal, it doesn't really have to occur 100% of the time in all uh, existing or studied human cultures, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's some people uh, are unhappy with the word universal when in, applied in that context, and I can understand that. Um, if, if we wanted to, we could refer to them as cross-cultural patterns or something like that. I, I use the word universal because... I use as my model linguistics, the study of linguistics, and they, that's the way it's used traditionally there. Um, I can understand people's qualms about it, but the reason for making that one continuous category is not to mask the differences. Certainly there are differences between things that recur in all cultures and things that recur in, say, 70% of cultures, uh, even though you might expect them to recur in 20 or some 20%. Uh, there's certainly a difference there, um, but in pursuing a research program on cross-cultural patterns or universals, you want to recognize the continuity that places some patterns in uh, broad distributions around the globe without uh, interaction of the traditions. And that, I, I mentioned before, genetically and aerially distinct, that's what that means. Genetically means they have, genetically distinct means they have different or, origins. Not uh, genetic in that sense is referred to uh, refers to genesis, not to chromosomes. Uh, so genetically distinct and aerially distinct means they haven't influenced one another extensively later on. So you want this part of a continuous research, these all of these different patterns part of a continuous research program, so that you're looking for uh, as you're in your research program you're looking for explanations that will further your understanding of both what recurs cross-culturally and what can vary. And so ideally you'd have a hierarchy of anal- uh, explanatory principles that would tell you why this pattern recurs 100% of the time, this one 90% of the time, and so on, and would also tell you what the relations among them are. So that um, something that recurs 100% of the time will presumably be one part of the explanation for things that recur, specifications of that general pattern that recur less frequently. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's also very interesting because for us to determine what are human universals and the list of them, of course, we can resort to a multitude of different disciplines, including psychology, anthropology, neuroscience, uh, and also the humanities in terms of analyzing some types of sources like the arts and texts and things like that. So, I mean, in order for us to determine what are the human universals, being them absolute or or only statistical, uh, it it functions as a sort of network of cumulative evidence from several different disciplines and sources, correct? Absolutely. Um, I might, uh, since I found out yesterday I can share a screen here, I might just show you, I mean, I, I think you've seen it, but uh, uh, the Literary Universals Project, is that up on your screen now? Mm-hmm. This is a project that... Um, Vito Evola and uh, Nigel Fab and I uh, initiated. It's housed at the University of Connecticut. Um, it's a, a website that publishes articles on different aspects of literary universal study. Uh, it includes, for example, an article by Donald Brown on human universals. Donald 
Brown being one of the, and maybe the major uh, anthropologist writing on that topic, who's written on that topic. Um, and the point of having a, uh, a, a center for research, it isn't a center, that makes it sound like it's an institution, uh, a central place where research can be funneled. Uh, the idea of it is that you need people from many different disciplines and also even within a given discipline, many different subfields. So if you're going to discuss certain aspects of literary universals, you, most of the things that I discuss are fairly um, uh, general patterns of narrative structure. And for that, you can largely re rely on translations because translations can be, unless they're, uh, unless the translator has made a decision to change the story, the story can be pretty easily preserved from the original to the translation. But there are other things that you, you need to know the language for. So if you're discussing image patterns, for example, image patterns don't aren't preserved across translations. So you need people who know if you're going to look at image patterns or whatever, uh, anything that's more textually uh, ingrained, uh, more textually uh, defined or specified. Uh, you need people to compare Chinese and uh, Kinyarwanda and uh, Arabic and uh, English. You need people who know Chinese and Kinyarwanda and uh, uh, Arabic and English. So uh, that's the purpose of something like the Literary Universals Project. Um, the other aspect to the, let me switch back to the, um, uh, stop sharing. Mm -hmm. So the other aspect of the uh, interdisciplinarity uh, that you mentioned is that it has to enter into even individual research programs. So um, we might get to later some discussion of um, aesthetics. I, I think we will because mm -hmm. you, you've indicated a number of things you're going to ask about that. Um, when I first began researching, trying to formulate an account of aesthetic response, I isolated a couple of different, there were a couple of different bodies of research that pointed towards distinct uh, information processing uh, aspects of aesthetic uh, pleasure. Mm -hmm. And uh, once I had two, I had the question of what, why would those two, why would you have two? Is there some pattern to that? Uh, and um, that was already relying on empirical research. But when I tried to figure out why there were two, it struck me that these two were two of three prominent ways of defining uh, conceptual categories. This therefore suggested that the third way of defining conceptual category might have aesthetic effects also, which is what I turn to next. And we can give examples of that later on, assuming we get to it. Or when I was, you mentioned the mind and its stories, when I was re researching, doing research work for the mind and its stories, I read, I simply read across a wide range of genetically and aerially unrelated traditions. Uh, and I didn't do, I was just actually doing that without a project in mind. And I began to notice these patterns across stories. And uh, as I formulated them, I began reading other traditions that I hadn't read more systematically. Once I had formulated a couple of the heroic and romantic patterns that I saw recurring across a range of traditions. I uh, sought to find a body of, of literature, or in this case, orature, mostly orature, that I hadn't consulted before, uh, a new uh, storytelling, uh, and um, read a number of works in that, which largely seemed to me to corroborate what I had said but there were also stories in there that seemed to form other patterns, which I then took up as part of the research project, going back to the traditions I had investigated initially. So these are two examples of the way that this uh, multiplicity, either multiplicity within literature itself or multiplicity across empirical disciplines outside of literature, that multiplicity has to continually be refolded into an ongoing research program. Mm -hmm.
Okay, very well. So let's now dig a little bit more into uh, a static human universals. You already alluded, alluded a little bit to them earlier in the conversation. But uh, okay, so should, should we start off by perhaps talking about the evolutionary basis of them because i mean uh, i guess that the evolutionary basis is not yet very well established because there are several hypotheses i think what and uh, of course it also uh, depends on what we're talking about because i guess that if we're talking about be, uh, for example, beauty, what we consider beautiful when we look at other people, perhaps uh, we would have to resort to uh, things related to sexual selection and perhaps what gets expressed in terms of the phenotype that is a proxy to good genes in both men and women. But perhaps if we're talking about uh, more um, things related to nature, perhaps then uh, we can talk about the savanna hypothesis that some people put on the table that perhaps what we like to see uh, in terms of paintings uh, and uh, I mean visually, aesthetically, is what we were exposed to uh, in the in the environments that we evolved in and in this particular case the savanna uh, that is a an open space where we can get a wide range of vision to see if there are predators c uh, coming close by and uh, and also to be able to to get a look at the prey that we and that we want to capture and things like that but basically the environment we evolved in and that our brains uh, were exposed to and were adapted to let's say to deal with that specific environment but I, I mean there are a lot of things on the table so could you please help us here by trying to refer to what are the important aspects to consider here in what pertains to the evolutionary basis of aesthetic universals and 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 I already uh, talked a little bit about beauty perhaps that's a different subject but if you could do it please right um well th this is really interesting because um you had said before you would ask something along those general lines but you hadn't given the examples of uh human beauty uh, with uh, uh, uh preferable genetic background uh, exam uh, exemplified in a phenotype, um, uh, nor had you given the example of landscape. And I was, when I was thinking about answering the more general question you brought up, I was, I had, I could even show it to you. I had jotted down that I could begin by mentioning uh, landscape uh, and uh, something a little more specific, but the same general idea as human, uh, your comments on human beauty, which is uh, facial symmetry. Um, the reason I bring I would have brought both of those up and the reason you brought both of them up, the reason we converged on that is that those are two standard examples of an evolutionary hypothesis with regard to aesthetics. Um, I actually differ from most people who discuss beauty in uh, evolutionary terms uh, in that I think uh, beauty ha should be explained by more general principles which are themselves adaptive. Uh, in some cases, the adaptation, uh, the adaptive function of those more general principles may indeed have been influenced by their specification in, say, uh, facial symmetry, human facial symmetry. That may have contributed functionally to uh, the evolution of uh, aesthetics, but it isn't a, it, it, the, evo the evolutionary principles are not specific to those two cases. So, um, I, take um, facial symmetry and the same thing applies to body left right uh, symmetry um, my argument as you know from uh, uh, beauty and sublimity is that empirically there are a range of things that seem to foster aesthetic pleasure our aesthetic response to anything uh, trees um, objects of use uh, tools um, uh, human beings, uh, uh, the way rooms are set up, uh, 
Uh, I was recently watching um, uh, The East is Red, a uh, 1965 propaganda film from the People's Republic of China, which is kind of crazy politically, uh, all praise to our great leader Mao Zedong and so on, but it's visually stunning. It's just gorgeous. And I think in many, in, in not many, in all of these cases, the same information processing and emotion processing uh, aspects recur. Uh, so uh, what about facial symmetry then? Well, my contention is that there's this large body of research that indicates what I call prototype approximation is a contributory factor to us uh, responding with aesthetic pleasure to a target. Prototype approximation is roughly averaging across experienced instances, but with a um, what Ramachandran calls peak shift. Uh, it's a bias toward uh, difference based on how you categorize the target. So um, uh, a good example, I'm, I'm going to show you something from not not a uh, not anything that I've done. Uh, it's uh, uh, let me see my current slide. Um, this is this uh, website faceresearch.org. It's it's fun to play with, so people might like to know about it. So. The uh, program will take various faces. You can click on various faces. We'll click on her, uh, click on her, click on her. Uh, let's click on her. So I'm perfectly fine looking people. I'm certainly not uh, going to criticize them, but you average them. And generally people say the composite that averages across the different Compo uh, different uh, contributory faces is more aesthetically pleasing than any of the contributing contributing faces considered on their own. So why is that? Well, the more faces you average, the closer you come to a prototype. Again, a prototype being roughly an average. Now, I did all women there because uh, one of our uh, most uh, salient and um, uh, forceful uh, forms of categorization is by gender. Uh, and so um, uh, in Richard Russell's research, for example, uh, Richard Russell study, this is from a, an article of his, uh, which you may, might even know, um, uh, ma Russell manipulated facial luminance uh, differences within portraits of men and women. And men and women start out with slight differences in facial luminance so that uh, there tends to be a greater um, uh, circumocular uh, versus uh, face, the rest of the face uh, luminance for uh, women that's a, that for women tends to be greater. And similarly, the uh, lip versus uh, lips versus the rest of the face tends to be uh, a starker contrast for women uh, than for men. And so... Um, uh, Russell manipulated uh, these facial luminance differences and asked people to judge uh, the faces aesthetically and found that if you increased facial luminance on male faces that decreased aesthetic the judgment of aesthetic pleasure whereas if you increase them on female faces it increased the aesthetic pleasure so in keeping with a difference that was in other words, if you enhance the category-based difference, uh, you increase the uh, aesthetic pleasure. If you diminish or reverse the category-based difference, you diminish the aesthetic pleasure. So uh, this, uh, the, reason, the reason I emphasize this is this is all explicable by reference to prototype approximation. None of it has to be specifically selected for in sexual terms. Now, this isn't to say that um, mate selection doesn't contribute to prototype approximation, but prototype approximation would presumably affect everything. It would affect our response to trees, our response to fruit, our response to vegetables, 
a whole range of things, uh, we'd have uh, preferred, we'd have preference for prototype approximation, and that's also true as the result of that mechanism. We don't, we don't confine our aesthetic response to mates. Our aesthetic response is related to a whole series of, I mean, is ev evoked by a whole series of other phenomena. Uh, I probably should pause there. Uh, as you know, I have other factors contributing to aesthetic response that are not uh, prototype based. There are, um, in terms of uh, information processing, there are some targets that uh, do not lend themselves well to um, do not lend themselves well to prototype approximation, and in those cases, we tend to uh, respond aesthetically uh, in terms of rule abstraction. If we're able to isolate a rule governed pattern without um, habituating to it, in other words, it, it hasn't become ordinary. Uh, Actually, before stopping, I should say that the uh, non-habituation principle applies to prototyping, too, because uh, uh, just as a general rule, we respond less to things we're habituated to. That's what habituation means. Uh, and uh, actually, let me, let me close this and switch back to uh, uh, me. We, um, we respond less to things that we habituate to. Uh, and in consequence, whether it's negative or positive, we don't have a strong response to it. So um, uh, things that are habitual are no longer aesthetically uh, consequential properties. So um, uh, you average across faces and the average you come up with will have two eyes and one nose. Uh, we don't count having two eyes and one nose as an aesthetically uh, uh, consequential property. Oh, oh I, I just realized I forgot something. Uh, I brought up uh, facial symmetry at the beginning and bodily symmetry, and I never got back to symmetry in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, symmetry uh, results automatically from prototype approximation. As you average across faces, uh, people, people's faces, some people's faces will be asymmetrical with a left side bias and some with a right side bias and you average across many faces and we see many, many faces in daily life. As you average across them, you automatically get a prototype that is uh, left-right symmetrical. So left-right symmetry comes out of prototype approximation just as a given. That's something that's going to happen when you have prototype approximation. Mm -hmm. So an elegant explanation for that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. And I want to add a follow up to that, because since we're talking about the um, of course, you didn't limit yourself to the evolutionary basis of beauty and aesthetics or, or human beauty and human aesthetics in this case. But I would also like to ask you again, uh, referring to evolution, if you think that there's good evidence that supports uh, the hypothesis put forth by people like uh, Geoffrey Miller and Steven Pinker, that perhaps uh, what, um, artistic behavior was also one of the targets of sexual selection. Yeah, I, I'm just not convinced that the bower bird has anything to do with um, uh, aesthetics. Um, I, uh, I mean, sh sure there. There might be some contribution, uh, but I tend to think that um, uh, aesthetic function is aesthetic response is principally a function of, uh, in cognitive terms, prototype approximation and rule abstraction, which are well established as evolutionary products. I mean, clearly, our ability to abstract rule unexpected rules. To isolate new patterns, it's one of the most fundamental cognitive processes we have. 
and the idea that this would give us pleasure when we were able to uh, abstract principles from experience is, um, I, I think, basically no one who accepts anything evolutionary would reject that. I don't think, I, I mean, that seems that we all agree on that. Um, similarly, uh, prototype approximation is a little more controversial because some people don't accept prototypes. They think we sort of ad hoc uh, generalize on the basis of exemplars. That seems to me enormously unlikely because it basically says every time we generalize, we just rid the brain of whatever we generalized. It just disappears and we go back to what, where we were with the exemplars beforehand. That seems extremely unlikely. Um, I do think exemplars are important, but I, I don't think that, that they eliminate uh, prototypes. A anyway, that's a little more controversial, but I, I think is fairly well established. Uh, I add to that emotion, uh, emo emo emotional aspects of uh, aesthetic response, and these would include um, uh, not interest, which is sort of the converse of non-habituation. You haven't habituated, so you maintain uh, attentional orientation toward the target. Um, uh, some sort of um, a reward system involvement. The reward system, in this case, uh, having two components, the uh, opioid component relating to the experience of pleasure and the dopaminergic uh, system uh, component relating to basically uh, the urge to continue on in a, a process of uh, engagement. Uh, seeking is what Panksepp calls the system for that reason. Um, uh, those are important. Those, however, are basically important to any sort of activity. If you're going to do anything, you need uh, some sort of interest and some sort of, uh, in other words, non-habituation and some sort of uh, reward system involvement, or you're probably not going to do it, whether it's reading a book or digging a ditch or exercising or whatever. Uh, one thing that seems to be more distinctive of aesthetic response is um, uh, attachment system involvement. And again, attachment clearly did not evolve for aesthetic reasons. It involved for childbearing, child raising, parent-child bonding, and so on. Um, uh, but there's a lot of evidence, even though weirdly the evidence hasn't been formulated in terms of attachment system, there's a lot of evidence that attachment response is very important to aesthetic feeling. Uh, so uh, as I discuss in uh, Beauty and Sublimity, there's research indicating that uh, one finds faces in general more attractive, more beautiful uh, when one's, jeez, uh, 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 oxytocin levels have been increased. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so those are the factors that seem to me crucial to aesthetic pleasure. And as such, uh, they are certainly ev evolved. And in some cases, aesthetic uh, uh, response may have contributed to the evolution. So I'm not saying the, the, the aesthetic feelings are irrelevant. They can be relevant, but they're not, it's, they're not processes narrowly ta tailored to aesthetics. The uh, uh, second thing I would mention is in connection with this, um, some researchers seem to think that there's something particularly male about at least certain forms of aesthetics, and that seems to me that seems to me misguided. Um, and uh, in terms of the uh, processes I mentioned, I see no reason to, to think that, well, I could imagine somebody arguing that uh, because of their role in childbearing, uh, women might be more uh, attachment sensitive than men are. I hope that is not the case. I'm, I certainly would not want to say that it's the case, but I could imagine an argument in that direction. But I see nothing in the system that I've defined that would favor males. So uh, I'm my whole system goes in a somewhat different direction. Um, uh, what to do about the bower bird? I, I don't, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just not inclined to, or the peacock's tail. I'm just not inclined to even, even though we, yes, peacock's tail is beautiful. We respond to it as beauty. 
in part because it's it's non-habitual patterning. Um, but I, I don't see it at those as uh, sources of aesthetic response, even though they can be targets of aesthetic response. Mm -hmm. Very well. Okay, so now let's see if I can articulate this question properly because it's a very difficult one and this came to my mind from all that you just exposed, let's say, uh, that is so you refer to the fact that there are very many factors that go into uh, our experience of aesthetics and beauty and all of those things and even more generally our our artistic expressions and things like that but so uh, there are some factors that perhaps some people would classify as socio-cultural ones like for example the fact that something is popular the fact that something is held in high regard by people who hold status in a particular society uh, perhaps things also related to conspicuous consumption because sometimes we appreciate some things aesthetically not really because of their intrinsic value but because they signal something else related to social aspects and to our position in the social hierarchy and things like that so but, but even those, they, they have a biological basis to them because, I mean, the ways we socialize with people also have a lot to do with our ability to survive because it was really important for us during our evolutionary history that we cooperated with other people because, I mean, we as humans by ourselves, we are not that good a predator or something like that to be able to uh, survive and to reproduce in our own. Uh, so uh, th that, that is one aspect of, of my question. The other aspect is, so having all of this in mind and perhaps uh, these social influences that also go into how we experience beauty and aesthetics and how we report those experiences, uh, couldn't it also be the case that perhaps sometimes there's a mismatch between what people really experience as being beautiful and what they report to other people that they experience as being beautiful just because perhaps they have one experience but since it doesn't go along with what is considered uh, um, proper experience let's say in the society that they are part of then p perhaps there's uh, th that's a confounding factor uh, when we're doing studies on uh, on human uh, aesthetic preferences or oh. I, I, I mean do, do all of these make sense or, or not? oh absolutely the, an excellent question uh, there are three things that I would say about it I hope I will remember all three when I get to the end. Um, the, the first one is uh, in Beauty and Sublimity, I make a general distinction between what I call social beauty and aesthetic response. And social beauty is a sort of competence we have to say what people in general are going to judge as beautiful. Uh, this is um, more general than, than beauty. We have a whole range of social judgments that bear not only on beauty and sublimity, uh, literary excellence, artistic excellence, profundity. Um, there are um, there are a lot of things that are widely considered profound, things in literary theory that are widely considered profound in my profession that I think are just fake. Um, but uh, I, I don't know the degree to which people genuinely feel they're profound, but you're sort of not competent in the field if you don't know that people think they're profound. So, so uh, on the one hand, there are judgments of what people will say is beautiful. Uh, that's what I call social beauty. Uh, on the other hand is aesthetic response, what you actually respond to aesthetically. And so uh, anyway, um, and now I've forgotten what I was talking about. Uh, uh, social, uh, oh, aesthetic response. So that um, uh, 
I usually use the example of somebody might say something like, uh, well, I know my baby isn't much to look at, but to me, she's the most beautiful thing in the world. And they could be speaking uh, hyperbolically, uh, but they might well mean it. They might mean that there's nothing that gives me greater aesthetic pleasure than looking at this slimy fish-like newborn uh, that anybody else would go bleh to uh, because of attachment system uh, involvement. Um, I mean, that's a sort of extreme example. But uh, so on the one hand, this is pervasive. Our uh, uh, judgments of social beauty can be wildly at odds with our uh, personal uh, aesthetic response. Um, now, uh, to what extent, the two other points are, uh, ha- one has to do with um, empirical research, uh, which you sort of brought up at the end, isn't it a confounding factor? And y- yes, it can be. And I think even though I've relied on uh, research in aesthetics, it varies very widely in uh, the way the questions are formulated and the degree to which these sorts of variables are controlled for. And uh, there are some experiments I discussed uh, briefly. It it isn't at all a focus of beauty and sublimity, but I discussed briefly a a couple of experiments that show the degree to which uh, the phrasing of a survey can be completely can make a, a study um, basically worthless uh, because the the uh, what the test subjects are asked is so vague, is so amorphous, is so unclear that you don't have any idea what the res- anyway. Um, so so that can be a problem. Uh, all that I can say is just like any other research program, as you formulate possible explanations, that will refine your empirical methodology. And hopefully these sorts of distinctions would be taken into account more fully in further studies. Um, I, I've had, for example, uh, productive interchanges with Anjan Chatterjee on this. And I don't know if, um, if he might, uh, I mean, I, do, I don't do that sort of lab research myself, that it'd have to be someone else. Um, but I don't know if he might uh, do lab laboratory research that uh, takes into account those uh, sorts of distinctions, uh, per- perhaps. Uh, but as I say, we we I felt that I've had good interchange with him on on uh, these issues. Uh, the third uh, thing is uh, the so we have the distinction between social uh, beauty judgments of social beauty and aesthetic response. And we have the issue of uh, confounding variables, especially these two, the distinction between uh, social beauty and aesthetic response in empirical research. The third is the issue of the degree to which uh, social prestige actually influences our aesthetic response. And um, there are some simple ways in which it does that. Uh, So one simple way in which it does that is that it leads us to question if we have a, a, a if we have a judgment that is uh, out of keeping with those of uh, other people generally in terms of popularity, or those of people we consider uh, uh, experts, people to whom we grant prestige. Uh, if we have a uh, response that's out of keeping with what we take to be their responses, that can motivate us to distrust our initial response, uh, which can be a good thing. Uh, I'm, I think in literary study, uh, somebody might encounter, a, a complicated modernist work, Joyce's Ulysses, uh, Faulkner's, uh, as I lay dying or, uh, sound in the fury, um, uh, Virginia Woolf's, uh, interior monologue and stream of consciousness work, uh, might begin it and say, uh, I, I, I had a student, for example, who read Mrs. Dalloway, which I think is one of the most beautiful works ever written. And it just, he had, he hated it. And um, my judgment, the fact that he had to read it for the class, um, his and my discussions of it and discussions of what to look for, changed his response to it entirely so that by the end of the semester, he loved the book. He felt it was really, he too felt it was really beautiful. I think in cases like that, that sort of self-questioning is valuable. 
Um, of course, it can also lead to other problems. Uh, it can lead to body dysmorphia when you have uh, social standards that you readjust your mind to and therefore think that you, you have to look anorexic or or if, you, or if you're a man, you have to look like uh, Mr. Atlas or something. Um, so it can be problematic, too. Um, so in any case, I think one route it goes by, the, the, the influence of social judgment on actual response, one route that that proceeds by is through self-questioning, self-criticism, and, and uh, re-examining the target and maybe sensitizing yourself to things in the target that you weren't sensitive to before. Um, however, it seems to also have more immediate uh, impact. And I suspect that that has something to do with one's initial uh, emotional stance, uh, the emotional orientation that one has uh, toward the object to begin with. Um, famous studies uh, show that not only do people, well, say you have people tasting wine, it isn't exactly the same thing. It, it's a judgment of pleasure, but whether it's a, an aesthetic, you know, judgment of aesthetic beauty or not, I, it's hard to say. But uh, people tasting wine, when they're uh, told different things about the same wine, they not only overtly judge it differently, but they show greater pleasure uh, neurologically to mm -hmm. the wine that has been labeled more prestigious than to the same wine labeled as less prestigious. And I don't have a good explanation for that. Where I personally would look first would be toward, to something like uh, prior emotional orientation, because uh, our emotional orientation either towards persons or towards objects greatly affects our emotional response to them. Uh, and this is true across a wide range of, uh, it's not just true aesthetically. It's true, uh, uh, for example, in, um, uh, interracial relations, for example. Um, you know, there are these famous studies where um, people, you have two actors, one white, one black, and uh, you have them do exa putatively exactly the same thing. One of them shoves the other playfully. And you have white test subjects who say, when the white guy shoves the black guy uh, playfully, say, oh, he's shoving him playfully. Then when the black guy shoves the white guy playfully, they say, Ooh, he's being aggressive. And it's clearly a function of what their prior emotional stance was. So that, that again, is part of my attempt to find broad explanatory principles that apply in specific cases and aren't particular to aesthetics. Mm -hmm. So excellent question. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, and this is all very interesting because it just came to my mind that perhaps uh, sometimes people get into conflict because uh, some of them are more oriented toward evolutionary explanations and others are more oriented toward more social, cultural aspects, let's say. But, but perhaps there's a way of uh, joining those two approaches together because, I mean, uh, I don't know if you agree with the approach that many evolutionary psychologists nowadays have that is the massive modularity of the human mind that basically is that perhaps our mind is composed of several different modules, cognitive modules, that we evolved each of them to deal with a specific type of evolutionarily relevant problem. An example would be reproduction, another survival, and all of those things. But perhaps uh, there's two things going around here at the same time. On the one hand, perhaps it is true that uh, we have an innate basis for what we consider beautiful. Uh, and, we, and we've already talked a little bit here about what we consider beautiful in terms of people's, as, uh, people's aspect, aspects uh, and what we consider beautiful in terms of our natural environments and our, the environments that surround us. But on the other hand, it is also part of our evolved repertoire to pay attention to what goes around uh, 
in our social environment because i mean again as i've already alluded to we really have to establish cooperative relationships uh, relationships at least with the people that are part of our in group otherwise it would have been very difficult if not impossible for us to survive uh, in our own so i, I guess that perhaps uh, there's a way to explain why, for example, sometimes, particularly with the advent of the modernist movement in the arts and then also the postmodernist one, that people uh, value things that before uh, perhaps we would consider ugly. But, 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 but then again, per perhaps uh, in those cases, the modules that are related to our social lives and how we move in our social environments uh, are get more activated to to explain how things that come from modernism and postmodernism uh, might have become popular because i mean if people that are high status uh, love them and, and perhaps they love them because uh, they uh, it is very easy for them to distinguish themselves from other people because those things are not really uh, likable let's say to the vast majority of people but then with time they set a standard and then if you want to be considered of uh, a good social position or if you want to, if you want for other people to look at you as having a good position in the social hierarchy perhaps you really have to learn to have a positive experience uh, when being in touch with those kinds of art Again, I don't know if I'm if I'm saying something that makes sense here or oh, not. But. Yeah, absolutely. No, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you bring up several different issues here. Uh, one of them is the relation between social and evolutionary, or social and biological, or uh, and yes, you're absolutely right. There are people who are simply much more interested, and this is fine, this is not a criticism, there's some people simply much more interested in, say, historical specificity or cultural distinctiveness, uh, and some people who are much more interested in uh, cross-cultural patterns. I happen to be somebody who's much more interested in cross-cultural patterns. Um, but I don't think these are mutually exclusive, and I think that was part of your point, was that the, they shouldn't be seen as mutually exclusive. Uh, for some reason, uh, to a great extent in literary study, at least this is changing somewhat. I think it's less true now than it was 15 years ago, say. But um, 15, when I was uh, a graduate student or had just gotten my PhD and was a young uh, uh, assistant professor, um, it was, uh, there was a widespread view that if you, I mean, a bizarre, tr truly bizarre view that if you were interested in what human beings had in common, you were some sort of reactionary fascist monster. And it's just, and, and of course, when you talk about this, you have to say, oh, well, you know, sure, universalism has been put to bad uses and we have to struggle against those. And we have to be on the, on the side of all those differentialists. Well, it, it's just nonsense. I mean, yeah, if you make false universal statements, then you, you can get things mucked up. Yeah, that's true. Anytime you make false statements, you can get things mucked up. But if you look historically, overwhelmingly, the um, oppression of one group by another has been uh, rationalized by reference to difference, not by reference to universality. So it's it, it was just a perverted idea but in any case it was widespread and this meant that uh historical and cultural specificity or as it was phrased then difference was uh what was um valued but uh my contention all along has been that you have to recognize both there's of course uh variability across cultures and historical periods 
and there are also commonalities. As many uh, cognitivists have pointed out, even to compare two items, they need to have something in common. So in, in order to compare different traditions of art, they have to have something in common that you're calling them art. Uh, uh, Dennis Dutton said that, for example. Um, now, in fact, I tend to see differences as much more superficial than most of my colleagues would see them. Um, and I would also generally not phrase it as a matter of differences. I usually phrase it as a matter of specification of universal principles. Uh, I mean, they are different specifications, but, um, and here again, my model is linguistic uh, in that uh, you can have uh, widespread uh, syntactic, morphological, or other principles that are shared across a wide range of languages, uh, but specific lexical items m may differ. Now, specific lexical items are what we see most obviously. So how in Mandarin means good, it doesn't mean what how means in English, right? So everybody, you know, one's inclination is to say, wow, those are different. But you can say good in English, it just doesn't use the same sound. You know, I mean, to use a very simplistic example, just to illustrate. Um, moreover, in order to understand cultural either cultural differences or cultural universals, cross-cultural universals, you need to combine both those forms of study. And again, I'll take a really simplistic case. Um, uh, it's uh, many writers, uh, a big Yana Shakuntalam, the recognition of Shakuntala, is generally considered the sort of masterpiece of Sanskrit drama. And uh, a number of writers chastised uh, or criticized uh, Sanskrit dramatists, including uh, Kalidasa, the author of A Beginner Shakuntalam, uh, for just being uh, disorganized and meandering all over and bringing in all sorts of irrelevant stuff and not being streamlined and so on. And um, basically, they were able to do that because they didn't recognize that A Beginner Shakuntalam is doing a wide range of things that are done maybe in slightly different ways, but are done in Western literature also. Uh, so one example is it establishes, uh, uh, it enhances what I call enhances unobtrusive symmetry by setting up, by pairing uh, acts. So the first act and the final act are parallel. The second act and the penultimate act are parallel and so on. It's very mathematically structured. Another instance that requires a knowledge of cultural uh, distinct distinction is foreshadowing. Uh, Kalidasa uses foreshadowing in uh, A Big Inner Shakuntalam, just like any number of Western works use foreshadowing. I, I don't know if this is true in Portugal, but in the United States, at least when I was growing up, grade school and high school, one of the main things you talked about in looking at literature was see how this foreshadows what's going to happen later on. So we're, you know, we're very, it's a very, very big topic in younger uh, days of literary study. So, uh, but you won't know that. Unless, so for example, uh, after the two main lovers meet in a beginner, you know, Shakuntala, Dushyanta and Shakuntala, they're the, the main couple, not the main, they're the couple that the story is about. After they meet, we hear the cry of a Chakravaka bird. Now, this just seems to somebody like Hegel, for example, writing on Sanskrit drama and the history of art, writing on it as something excessive and incoherent and monstrous. Uh, this just seems something irrelevant. But in fact, the, um, there's a myth connected with the Chakravaka bird to which the call of the Chakravaka bird alludes. And that's the myth of uh, male and female Chakravaka bird mating and then being separated in the course of the night, but then being reunited in the morning. This is a, a commonplace story that everybody watching the play would have known about. So as soon as you have that, you, the cry of a Chakravaka bird, you expect that the lovers are going to be separated, but then eventually reunited. So that's a case where you have to have specific cultural knowledge in order to make any sense out of what is in fact a cross-cultural pattern. Um, uh, the second thing you brought up in your question was um, the uh, massive modularity hypothesis. And um, 
as you've probably gathered from my previous answers, well, two things. The first thing I should say is that um, I I wouldn't agree with somebody who objects to that in principle. Sh sure, that people like uh, John Tooby and Leda Cosmides examining, you know, uh, uh, researching in that tradition. Uh, you know, they're doing valuable work, and it's a research program that should be followed through in competition with other research programs. So I'm not at all dismissing it, but as you probably answer, gathered from my previous answers, I'm more inclined to find, I, I feel it is uh, simpler in the um, uh, Occam's razor sense. It's uh, simpler and thus uh, theoretically preferable to have more general principles that apply more broadly. And that's why, for example, I don't have anything like an aesthetics module. I have the idea that there are various processes that have a range of applications and when combined, give you aesthetics or aesthetic response. Perhaps it adds something to do with the social aspect because toward the end of, of my, my question, I referred to the fact that perhaps uh, there are times where we value something beca because the modules that are related to or, or operate under uh, social context or social conditions or that, that um, or, or that deal with information that come from the social environment get more activated than other modules. Oh. That yeah, sure. I, you're absolutely right. Social interaction. Again, I wouldn't phrase it in terms of modules, um, although I certainly would admit that the um, uh, the cognitive and affective principles that bear on our interactions with human beings are more closely integrated with one another than they are with a range of other uh, cognitive principles. So those relating to physics or something. So I'm I'm certainly willing to distinguish a, a, a set of interrelated cognitive principles that relate to language, for example, or that relate to theory of mind, or that relate to uh, folk physics. So certainly there are complexes like that. I'm not inclined to see them as modules, uh, however, because uh, modules are typically understood as self-enclosed and interacting only in outputs. And I tend to see the principles as more interacting at more levels than at the level of output. So um, but that's maybe for the sorts of things we're discussing, maybe that isn't uh, a crucial issue. Uh, but certainly there are social aspects to literature that um, I've talked about in some places, but I haven't emphasized either in the universals work or the aesthetics work. Uh, but for example, uh, I think a central aspect of the uh, value of literary or artistic study is in what Bernard Rimet refers to uh, as partage in French, sharing. It's we have a desire to share things with other people. Part of our experience of being socially engaged with other people is sharing experiences with them. And uh, aesthetic experiences, literary experiences, art experiences, music experiences, we, we like to go to a concert with somebody else and talk to the person about it afterwards or walk through a gallery with somebody else. Um, and that sort of social sharing is, I would see it as related to my analysis of aesthetic response because aesthetic response is so bound up with attachment bonding. And this is, a friendship is a form of attachment bonding. And so cultivating attachment or romance, I mean, you go on a date with somebody or go, go with your partner to a gallery or to a concert or whatever. Um, these are all these all involve centrally involve attachment feelings. And so in my account, they're very closely related. But even if one didn't have that account, it's clear that part of our sociality, it does involve that sort of social sharing. And that's clearly an important aspect of literature and art. Mm -hmm. OK, very well. OK, so what would you like for us to know more about uh, human universals when it comes to fictional literature? Because, I, I mean, perhaps there are several categories of, uh, univer uh, of human universals in this case. Perhaps there are human universals in terms of emotions, in terms of types of characters, in terms of genres and things like that. So 
what 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 would you say are perhaps the main things that we have to take into account here? Well, there have been two real areas of sustained research in literary universals. One is the area that I've been working on, which is uh, narrative structure, story structure, I should say, story structure, and recurring story structures. And as I mentioned before, that's easier to research on one's own because one can rely on translations since story structure tends to be preserved pretty well across translations. The other area in which there's been a great deal of research is in particular as formal aspects of poetry. So uh, lineation, the structure of lineation, the length of lines, the use of uh, uh, a, a, such uh, formal aesthetic features as alliteration, assonance, rhyme, uh, uh, meter, uh, organization of uh, syllables, in uh, ways distinct from, in recurring ways distinct from syntactic structure, thus in lineation. Uh, all of these things related to particular features of poetic structure, particular formal features of poetry have been pretty well uh, researched. Writers ranging from um, uh, uh, Jeffrey Russom and Nigel Fab, uh, who are both involved with the Literary Universals Project, uh, Paul Kaparsky to uh, Morris Holly and, and others. Um, so that's another, well, I, excuse me, I said two areas, there are actually three areas, I, I almost forgot one. So those are two areas that, that have been well researched in uh, universals. Uh, a third area that hasn't received, seems to me as extensive treatment, but has received good treatment is the use of metaphors, uh, cross-cultural use of metaphors. Just the reason I sort of briefly forgot about that is it's a sort of really, uh, it's presented, and this is perfectly reasonable, as a subset of research on metaphor rather than a subset of research on universals. So it's sort of categorized in my mind differently. But um, that's another area where there's been pretty good work. And all of those areas still require more work. Uh, there's more research to be done on very things such as character typology, which is uh, related to story structure, but not identical with story structure. There uh, and uh, formal features of, I mean, um, these different writers on formal features of poetic uh, structure have different accounts of how that operates and what the exact formal features are and so on. So uh, there's plenty of room in both of those areas for further research. But really, everything else in literature has hardly been uh, studied at all. So uh, I have a little bit on uh, um, image patterns but I'm very constrained because I had to rely either on a works where I could check the original to see if the image was there or where the translator actually gave me a footnote saying in the original, this is an image of such and such. So, um, so that was very constraining. Uh, so image patterns, for example, the whole area of what's called discourse um, is almost unresearched in a cross-cultural uh, uh, area. So such things as varieties of narration, uh, narrator knowledge, narrator attitude, uh, uh, narrational structure. I mean, it's clear to me that um, a number of traditions, I haven't worked on this formally, but just informally from reading in a number of different traditions, it's obvious that a number of different traditions have um, uh, developed cliffhanger cliffhanger endings for uh, episodes. So, I mean, you get in, uh, in it's, it's a kind of cliche of uh, Chinese uh, prose fiction that you'll get, get to an end of the chapter and, and you know, they'll, they'll actually end with like a question. It'll be something like, and, and what will happen? Will Wang fall off the cliff? Will he be rescued? To find out, read the next chapter. <laughs> so, or, or whatever. So it's, it's formally marked in much uh, Chinese prose fiction. But though I've observed this informally, it's not something that I've researched. Uh, but all of those techniques of such thing, which, what's called implotment, the order of uh, 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 story elements, whether they're chronological or not chronological, if they're not chronological, whether there's a preference for flashbacks or flash forwards, how you mark flash forwards or flashbacks, 
um, uh, whether there's repetition of incidents, uh, wh whether uh, incidents are told differently from different points of view with different narrational foci, uh, all of these sorts of questions that are important in narratology within generally focused on the Western tradition or modern non-Western traditions, which don't really count for universal study because in mo the modern period, everybody's reading everyone else, so you don't get aerial distinctness. You get everybody's influencing everyone else, so it doesn't show anything that's relevant to universalist study. Uh, but these are areas that are very important to neurological study, but have hardly been touched on in uh, the study of universals. So uh, if anybody watching this interview, for example, this discussion, uh, has things that they, in any of these areas, the areas that have been researched, such as story structure or poetic form, or areas that haven't, such as narrational or plotment features, character typology, and so on. If anyone watching this has any interest in that, uh, I'd urge them to go to the Literary Universals Project, uh, maybe query us if they were thinking of writing something. What we're also having a little symposium in May. At the end of May, it, they, there's a call for papers on the uh, uh, Literary Universals Project website. Somebody might be interested in that. There's, it's just a vast area that's hardly been where research has hardly begun. It's, it seems to me mu much less research than, say, cross-cultural patterns in music, which has, has a longer history. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very interesting. Uh, and I think that another aspect that we can study in, in fictional literature in terms of human universals, uh, and I am going to ask you this because I've recently had on the show uh, Dr. Michelle Skelly's Sugiyama, and she does oh. a lot of work on oral storytelling. So I would like to ask you, uh, so uh, about the role that fictional literature and perhaps this goes back even before we've invented written language and written and literature in general this goes back to oral storytelling what is the role that it plays in human societies because i mean when we ask people this i guess that one of the Mo, uh, one of the big answers that people give is related to the fact that perhaps stories or uh, fictional literature, uh, in, the role that it plays in human societies is to convey moral messages. But because, uh, but perhaps that's one side of it, but it probably uh, uh, has many other factors that go into it, right? Sure. Um, first of all, before answering the question, Michelle has uh, a couple of essays on the uh, Literary Universals Project, and uh, I, I is pro well, I mean, as far as I know, is actually going to be speaking at the uh, at the uh, conference at, in Connecticut in May. I mean, I, I anticipate that she'll be speaking there. So, uh, great person to interview. She does very good work. Uh, anyway, so uh, the purpose of literature, well, certainly uh, literature does typically operate in such a way as to, uh, you might call it convey moral messages. It, it uh, typically does have some sort of moral or political function. Uh, however, I don't think that's the, um, that initiates the development or production of literature. I think literature principally is produced uh, because of our engagement with stories. It's pleasurable to experience stories, and um, it's pleasurable for adaptive reasons. And I don't mean the adaptive reasons that are usually given. What I mean is, this goes to another uh, work of mine, How Authors' Minds Make Stories, which is a book on sim simu literature and simulation, and what the uh, evolutionary function of simulation is. So. Uh, I there discuss literature as a specific form of simulation or imagination is a more common uh, way of phrasing it, a less technical way. What's usually referred to in ordinary languages, imagination is referred to as simulation in uh, cognitive science generally. Um, it's our, what's sometimes called offline uh, 
uh, projection of sequences of uh, particular sequences of causality, usually involving agents. So people doing stuff, uh, either uh, counterfactually or hypothetically. In other words, so uh, we might simulate. Well, what would ha- hypothetically what would happen if I went and talked to my department head about getting a course release or something? That would be a simulation. Um, so literature is one form of simulation, and simulation is a, a crucial evolutionary development. Um, w- why is it crucial? Well, it's crucial because of that offline part. It allows us to think through uh, possible courses of action or to learn from past mistakes. You know, I, I look back and say, oh, if only I had done this instead of that, then that would have all di- been different. And I learn that the next time I'm faced with a similar situation, I react in the alternative way that I simulated, not in the way that I did react. Uh, so it's, it's evolutionarily very important that we're able to reduce the costs of uh, simply learning from actually making mistakes by simulating behaviors that we can, uh, so we can eliminate some, obviously not all, we can eliminate some uh, mistakes uh, through simulating, through imagining the uh, uh, negative outcomes that would eventuate if we pursur- pursued the uh, line of action that we're imagining or that we're simulating. So uh, what I talk about there in uh, my account of simulation is that um, for simulation to work evolutionarily, it has to have several features. One feature is that it has to approximate the uh, hedonic quality of the outcome. So in other words, if imagining something that has a positive outcome is supposed to encourage us to pursue that uh, line of action, then imagining it should give us some pleasure. We should be attracted to it. Conversely, if uh, imagining uh, an outcome that would be a failure is going to dissuade us from the action, then it should have uh, some sort of aversive we should have some sort of aversive response to it. We should go, ooh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to do that, and thus avoid it. So it has to be motivational. Um, that is not surprising given the way simulation works. Simulation works by activating the same general areas, not in all details, of course, but broadly speaking, the same areas that would be activated if we were, were in, in fact, engaging in or seeing or sensing the, uh, what we're imagining. So we don't have like a one set of neurons that are all for imagination and another completely separate set that are for acting and perceiving and so on. They're significantly overlapping. They're not fully identical because we experience actually doing something as different from imagining doing it. But they're, uh, the neuron populations involved in the two processes are uh, largely identical, though not completely. So it's not surprising that our emotional response in the two cases either uh, – pleasurable or aversive would be a version of what we would experience in the actual, uh, if the actual events, if the events actually occurred. So that makes sense. Um, uh, there are two qualifications, however. The first qualification is that the pleasurable experience can't be so pleasurable that we have no motivation to actually do the thing. So it has to be uh, a limited pleasure because if, if, if imagining, you know, getting a good job made me as happy as getting a good job, well, <laughs> why fill out the application form and go through the interview and so on? I, I'm just as happy imagining the, the uh, job. The, the other more uh, difficult one is um, that the aversive uh, response to failure or to uh, negative outcomes has to be compensated for by some sort of enjoyment. Why do I say that? Well, because if we, if it weren't compensated for in any way, if there weren't anything that drove us, that motivated us to imagine aversive outcomes, as soon as we had the inkling that something was going to be an aversive outcome, we would just stop thinking about it. And then it wouldn't motivate us to avoid it. So we have to be able to pursue trains of thought that will lead to aversive outcomes, even though the outcomes are unpleasant. Um, I cite research that suggests that there's dopaminergic 
system activity in simulation generally. And if that's true, that's all that's needed. The dopaminergic uh, activation, the reward system, or in Pangsep's term, seeking system, encourages us to pursue lines of activity. It drives us to pursue lines of activity. So we have this complex simulatory uh, uh, processing, um, these complex simulatory processes that are highly adaptive and have complex um, implications regarding our emotional responses to uh, imagined situations and including uh, a pleasurable component to even aversive situations. So how does this all relate to literature? Well, my contention is this is exactly what happens in literature. Uh, in an, uh, a brief response in a couple of years ago that was be published, that I published in uh, Behavioral and Brain Sciences, I spell this out in more, more precisely than I do in how, author, how authors, mind, or more con concisely, I should say, than I do in how authors' minds make stories. Um, and what I argue there is that this solves what are called the fiction, paradox of fiction and the paradox of tragedy. The paradox of fiction is that we enjoy, either enjoy or feel grief over fictional stuff. We know that Romeo and Juliet don't exist, and yet maybe we feel grief over their deaths. We uh, uh, know that Hamlet doesn't exist, but maybe we don't want him to commit suicide. But of course, there's no one there to commit suicide. So this is seen as paradoxical. But in fact, it isn't paradoxical because it's the way simulation operates. Simulation operates to have these emotional effects. The paradox of tragedy is that we experience pleasure in something that is apparently aversive, tragedy. And both of the examples I gave, Romeo and Juliet and Hamlet, are tragic. So why would that be? Well, again, it's not a particular problem because, again, that's the way that simulation operates. So getting back to your question. So what I think is going on with um, the production of literature is that we have these simulative propensities and we are therefore driven to simulate regularly. We simulate all the time. We are even simulating an actual experience because we're filling in aspects of a current situation that we're not directly experiencing. So, um, you know, somebody, you know, if, if you're talking to a class or something and somebody has a funny face, you go, oh, I wonder if I said something wrong because you're simulating what they're thinking. So, you, so simulation is going on all the time. Um, literature is a systematic, finely honed form of simulation. I think that's what its primary function is. I don't think that that means it's like cheesecake in uh, Steven Pinker's term. Um, cheesecake is something we have a taste for, but that's pretty much bad for you. I mean, there's really not much good that's done by eating cheesecake. Um, I don't think that's at all the case with uh, literature. Uh, one of the reasons is that literature does involve moral or political uh, purposes, uh, though I think that there are two re I don't think that those are those initiated, as I said before, I think they're initiated by the simulative processes. But part of our uh, pleasure in experiencing any simulation is not only the immediate pleasure of, say, sensation or uh, esteem from others or whatever we might uh, uh, simulate, but is also uh, a moderated or, excuse me, a modulated uh, enjoyment when we judge our experience relevant relative to our own moral principles. So that even in our ordinary simulation, if I imagine doing something uh, that I might consider unethical, part of my aversive response to that will be my judgment that I would consider that unethical and I would be doing it myself. So moral evaluation and political interests are part of our simulation and part of our, exper our emotional experience in simulation. So I think they first of all enter that way. They also enter, uh, in the moral message as you said, enters that way. Um, 
They also enter, however, more self-consciously through uh, processes of social generation of literature. So that, and this is what makes literature a little more complicated and where I might diverge from the, um, perhaps, I mean, I, I don't want to sound like I'm criticizing literature. Obviously, I teach literature. I think I love literature, you know, but um, there may be a tendency among cognitivists who very kindly celebrate literature. There may be a tendency to underestimate its sometimes politically harmful effects. Uh, and one of the reasons it can have politically harmful effects, it can be, can be sexist or racist or other sorts of ideology. One of the reasons it can do that is because of the social system in which it's produced. The social system is almost necessarily uh, uh, greatly uh, disproportionately influenced by people who are dominant in the society and uh, much less influence, influenced by people who are dominated in the society. So there is, in Marxist terms, in Gramscian terms, the, uh, there's going to be a tendency for literature to reflect hegemonic ideas, the ideas of dominant classes. And this is true whether you have a feudal system where uh, artists are patronized, they're actually paid, you know, kept uh, by particular aristocrats, or uh, uh, capitalist uh, ec economies in which the author has to uh, uh, get uh, some sort of firm to publish his or her work and circulate it and so on. So um, there are all these social factors that affect the political consequences of a work. Uh, the final thing I would mention is uh, something that I tend to think of as somewhat incidental to the purposes of uh, producing literature, but that is uh, a very important consequence of producing literature, which is um, a number of writers, Kidd and Castano, um, uh, Keith Oatley, of course, um, oh, Keith Oatley's colleague at, at uh, York, I'm forgetting his name, Marr, um, uh, have done work indicating that study of literature can improve theory of mind skills. And this doesn't seem to me surprising. I mean, it's not fully established, but it seems to me something that one would have expected, that uh, focused attention on complex aspects of theory of mind uh, and um, focused attention on uh, developing on the, the um, simulative uh, enhancement of empathic response to groups of individuals that one ordinarily wouldn't even think about, uh, that that's, those sorts of things would enhance theory of mind skills and empathic sensitivity. That's what one would expect. Uh, and so this is, again, why I don't think that literature is like cheesecake, uh, because it, it, e even, if, even if we're not consuming literature or producing literature principally for the theory of mind and empathic benefits. And of course, some people are doing it for that reason, but many of us, many people aren't, most people aren't, I think. Even if they aren't doing it for those uh, benefits, it has those benefits. So um, to conclude by going back to Pinker, maybe, oh, uh, one other thing on that, um, that isn't to say it's unique in that. I'm, I, I'm, I'm guessing there are other ways in which people can enhance their, you, you, you if, you're, if you don't really like literature all that much, that doesn't mean you're necessarily an unempathic person. So uh, presumably there are many other ways one can enhance empathic response or theory of mind skills, but literature does seem to be a valuable way of doing that. So maybe, um, maybe uh, a different, a better way of using the analogy, the sort of analogy that Pinker, Stephen Pinker wants to set up would be something like, literature isn't like cheesecake, literature is maybe like fruit. Uh, you know, we eat fruit, we may not eat fruit because we're going to get vitamin C or whatever, maybe we eat fruit because it tastes good, but it does give us vitamin C. So it is beneficial for us and fiber and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but that, of course, doesn't mean you can't get vitamin C or fiber or whatever from other sources, too. So you, you don't have to eat fruit, but it's a good thing. Eating fruit is good. Mm -hmm. And le reading literature is good. Mm -hmm.
Yes, uh, and perhaps uh, about that last point, uh, about the relationship between uh, fictional literature and theory and the development of theory of mind or perhaps the expansion of some of our uh, abilities regarding theory of mind, uh, perhaps in societies that lack uh, literature, like more traditional societies of hunter-gatherers or horticulturalists and, and other peoples like that, uh, p perhaps oral storytelling fulfills that role as well. Absolutely. Uh, I, I completely agree. So uh, when I say literature, I sort of tacitly mean literature and orature, rather than repeating it every time. Um, I, since you've brought that up, I might... It might be worth noting that there is um, I've forgotten his name. Let me see if I, I wrote it down. Let me see if I can. You, the guy who says that uh, the Piranha, uh, yeah, Daniel uh, Everett. Dan the, the Everett, yeah. Yeah, who says that the Piranha don't have storytelling. And I found an interview with him where uh, the interviewer asks uh, the, about the Piranha. They do not have creation myths, but they do practice storytelling. And he says, no. They get together as they love gossip about how we are, about how, how are people doing? Is anyone sick or has anyone died? They share the news about what is going on. So in other words, they engage in storytelling. What, what are they doing if, if they're saying this is what happened? This is how the person died. This is what the news is. Gossip is storytelling. Now, I, I'm guessing what he means is that they don't have a canon of stories that gets repeated. And I don't know whether they do or not. I, I tend to be skeptical of these discoveries of huge differences. Um, they they seem to me to be like uh, the, uh, I guess it's Mark Twain joke. Uh, maybe it's not Mark Twain. I want to attribute it to Mark Twain anyway. Uh, the news of my death has been greatly exaggerated. Uh, it's, it seems to me that often happens with these stories of these huge differences. You either find that the properties that are supposedly so weird in the other society we have, or the properties that they supposedly don't have, they do have. Now, there may be in different proportions, but they, uh, we generally find them. An example that I often use of this doesn't concern the Paraha, but concerns the Aymara, who you may remember a number of years ago, there was this big thing that it was discovered that they think the future is behind they uh, model the future on behind and the past on in front. And, you know, this is like totally bizarre. We would never do any such thing. We would never think of the future as behind. Old age is creeping up on me. It's not creeping up on me from in front. Or um, uh, Andrew Marvell's To His Coy Mistress. Uh, but at my back, I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. What's hurrying near is the future. And it's hurrying at my back. So we actually do use this when the future is unknown. So, in fact, what seemed to be this radical difference is a difference in proportion. Now, that's interesting. It isn't to say that it's insignificant. It's worth knowing that there's a difference in proportion or a difference in sort of default case. But it's not an absolute difference. And I suspect that we'll find out there. Is, well, I mean, even from this quote from Everett, it seems clear that there isn't an absolute difference. They are engaging in storytelling of some sort if they're giving the news. So storytelling seems to be, as far as I can tell, an absolute universal despite such uh, news reports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The the case with Dan Everett and the Piraha is very interesting, and I recently also interviewed Dr. Iris Berent. That I don't know if you know about her, but she's a linguist, and we also refer to the particularities that Dan Everett reports about mm -hmm. uh, the Piraha, and he also refers to the fact that they don't think about the future and that their language lacks recursion. That is one of the elements that Noam Chomsky included in his universal grammar. But I mean, <laughs> I guess it's, it's still very, very controversial. I mean, at least the findings as Everett reports them ab about the Piraha. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, okay, so um, okay, so we have to finish because uh, we've already done more than uh, 90 minutes here. Oh, yeah. But, uh, but, uh, but anyway, uh, just before we go, uh, I, I wanted to talk with you uh, also about the relationship between literature and emotion, but perhaps we could leave that to another interview if you don't mind. Uh, so ju just one last question. Since you work in a humanities department and uh, literature. Uh, I mean, when people think about literature, they associate it with the humanities and not really with scientific discipl disciplines like psychology, anthropology, neuroscience, and all of those things that you apply in your work. Do you get a lot of backlash from some of your colleagues, particularly the ones that are perhaps uh, more into postmodernism uh, and in particularly in regards to studying innate aspects of the human mind and human universals? Oh, uh, well, my colleagues, if by my colleagues you mean people at the University of Connecticut, no. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it, you know, it's not like the perfect place to be and no place is perfect. We have tensions and so on. But I, I've never encountered that as a problem at University of Connecticut. Um, the, uh, if you mean in the profession generally, well, that's certainly an issue. Um, again, it's less an issue than it was. Well, when I wrote, uh, I mean, I've told you, you may have even heard this story because I've talked about it in other like interviews or elsewhere. But uh, when I wrote uh, The Mind and Its Stories, I, uh, I sent it to a number of different publishers. Oh, well, actually, even before that, when I wrote um, uh, Politics of Interpretation, I had sent it to different publishers, and it was routinely rejected. The um, uh, Mind and Its Stories, which uh, has, you know, once it got published, it was fairly well received, um, although maybe more well received among psychologists than among literary people, but, but still, but it took all, I mean, it was re rejected by something like 20 publishers. And um, I mean, I, I remember once sending it to a publisher that uh, I sent it on like a Monday and it was back in my mailbox on Friday and it was in the same box I sent it in. As far as I can tell, what the editor did is opened the box, saw the word universals in the title, closed the box and sent it back because it didn't even seem to have been removed uh, from the box. So um, so certainly it's been uh, people in literature have often not been very open to the idea of uh, cognitive study of literature, literary universals. Um, anything like that. And it, part of it was this bizarre political atmosphere. Or I, I think Gerald Graff was right when he said, it's not really a political atmosphere, it's pseudo politics. It isn't even really politics. It's like a pretense of being politics. So um, this sort of pseudo politics of cultural, you're, you're bad if you don't celebrate difference. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, that has been a problem, but I think it's way less of a problem now. And uh, I mean, when I started doing this uh, cognitive approach to literature 30 years ago, there was hardly anyone else doing it. I mean, there was the uh, Mark Turner and uh, people around Mark, but Mark was almost, that was almost it. I mean, that was very good. It was very valuable work, um, but it was... It was more allied with cognitive linguistics and Lakoff, uh, Lakoff, a Lakoffian orientation than it was really with literary study. And if, but then, of course, when I started writing on it, mine was perhaps more allied with cognitive science than with literature departments, too. But again, this has changed massively. You have no idea. It was like to mention the sort of work cognitivists are doing now. We, 25 years ago, was it was almost unspeakable, and now there's a... Uh, one of the uh, main uh, groupings, I mean, the, the Modern Language Association, the main association for humanists in the United States, for literary people in the United States is the Modern Language Association. And it has, 
subsections uh, based on either literary period or theoretical approach. And there's a cognitive approach, cognitive and affect uh, uh, approach approaches forum. There, I don't know why they call them fora, but it's uh, a forum. That's one of the main theoretical approaches now uh, in the MLA. So, due to the very good work of a wide range of people interested in this, uh, in, all in the humanities, this has really developed enormously in the past three decades, and I think it's going to continue to develop. It, the uh, MLA convention every year, it seems to have more interest. The uh, sessions on cognitive approaches are well attended. Uh, it seems to me very promising. Mm -hmm. And do you, would you say that perhaps uh, the fact that at a certain point, perhaps 30 years ago, uh, that because scientific disciplines like sociobiology and evolutionary psychology and evolutionary anthropology and others that have or apply a, a biological approach or biological slash psychological approach to the human mind, that because they took off by then, that uh, might also have uh, helped with that enterprise of cognitive literature or, or not? Oh, yeah. I think two, two sets of developments in the sciences, one evolutionary, the other neuroscientific, uh, made a big difference. Um, personally, I think that the uh, develop, developments in cognitive science that partially predated that were equally important but they don't seem to have caught the imagination of humanists in the way that either the uh, neuroscientific studies, especially when uh, non-invasive brain scanning procedures became more widespread. Uh, those, uh, the, the, uh, the earlier cognitive scientific developments just didn't capture the imagination of humanists in the way that either those neuro neuroscientific non-invasive procedures did or the way the evolutionary Uh, sci evolutionary psychology and related uh, forms of evolutionary thought uh, did. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So, Dr. Colm Hogan, just before we go, uh, apart from the website that, you that you've already showed us here, uh, what, are some of the, what are some of the other uh, online sources if people want to get in touch with more of your work? Oh, uh, online sources. Uh, well, as regards my work, I guess the only other one would really be my web page at the University of Connecticut. So, which one, if one wanted to look it up, one just go to the search for University of Connecticut and go to the English department, and then personnel. But um, uh, the only website that I have much to do with really is the Literary Universals Project. Mm -hmm. Okay, very well, and I will and now be leaving. And now, and now you're, and now you're uh, this interview on your, on the dissenter. <laughs> okay, okay, that's good to know. That's good to know. And I will be leaving links in the description box to the rest of your work, including also your books, which are very interesting. I haven't read them all yet, but but the ones I've read, they are all excellent. So and and so, Dr. Colmogan, as I said. Uh, perhaps in the future we could have another conversation because there are a lot of topics that I left out of this interview just to try to keep it a bit shorter than we would have needed it to be. But anyway, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show. It was a pleasure to be on the show and I'm, I'm grateful and uh, honored to be included. Hi everybody, thank you a lot for watching this interview until the end and also by the way for coming to my channel. Uh, as you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep this channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge. Any amount, even if just one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelina, Jim Frank, Francis Ford and Hans Frederick Sunda. Thank you for all.